I'm Leo, founder of Graphistry, and this is the talk, Building the First GPU Visual Graph AI Platform with End-to-End -end Apache Arrow. Hi, um, I'm Leo, the founder of Graphistry, and today I'm going to be talking about building the first GPU Visual Graph AI platform with end-to-end -end Apache Arrow. Before we um, go deep into the Apache Arrow side, um, which is pretty pervasive in our platform, I want to give you a feel for the types of problems that we in our computer community are working on, and then you can see um, where um, and why Apache Arrow just keeps coming up um, across the platform. So if we step back, um, kind of an exciting thing happens uh, at the beginning of the year where um, Science, one of the top uh, um, journals in the world, um, took a look at what, what's been going on across the community and, the, and named the 2021 breakthrough of the year to be graph AI driven software, which can turn, um, turn out accurate protein structures by the thousands. Um, and they're referring to uh, graph neural networks for that. Um, to give you a bit of intuition for what's going on there, I, I really like this picture from um, the journal Chemistry Science. On the right, it's uh, kind of um, giving you intuition for how they're using neural networks here. Um, so as a lot of folks know, neural networks can deal with all sorts of data. In this case, when we're doing protein folding, we might look at the X and Y and Z positions of the things we're folding. The, um, there's a lot of heterogeneity there, like we have different kinds of proteins, we have different kinds of bond, um, bonding types for, um, going on. You know, all that kind of stuff that when you have all those parameters, neural networks are, are well known for um, doing well. But at the same time, uh, if you remember your high school or your college chemistry, they there's these interesting structures. Like chemistry is kind of like circuits where as you build up the proteins, they can do more and more interesting things. And so this gets into this notion of graphs where we really want the AI to understand the graph structure. And the more that it can kind of look beyond just the immediate uh, node and look a little bit further out, that really changes what can be done. And so graph neural networks is this realization that by teaching neural networks the ability to understand broader structure in our data, in this case, uh, um, protein structures, we can really multiply sort of what's going on and, and really shortcut it and, and do some interesting things. Um, protein folding is important for things like cancer, you know, solving cancer, making new biofuels, but um, in industry, we actually see a lot of other graph problems that are happening. So for graphistry, we end up working with teams doing things, for example, um, uh, uh, security teams trying to look at their zero trust network and making sure no accounts are doing strange behaviors. So a lot of connect dots there. Um, uh, here on this table, we're showing um, a lot of different top companies and how they're starting to use graph AI. So for example, it's no big surprise a company like um, eBay um, will be doing a lot of um, connect the dots for their fraud problems. Um, Airbnb, um, actually, I think I have DeepMind and Google here. They're really well known for things, for example, recently now, whenever you try to get driving directions on Google Maps, that's going to be a graph neural network trying to find that shortest, uh, fastest path for you. On our side, we're seeing a lot of manufacturing companies trying to do, for example, supply chain intelligence. You know, If your packages are, are late or you're waiting for your items to get assembled and shipped around the world, that's, uh, that's actually a graph problem. And so... Um, just in general, this has become um, one of those things that wherever you are in industry has just become so pervasive. And to make this an AI uh, a, a broachable problem, that means getting not just AI or neural networks, but graph neural networks. And so for Graphistry, um, now they're kind of getting a sense of the types of problems we're working on. Um, it's interesting to um, start getting a little closer to the analyst and, and where that data pipe is and, and how Arrow um, pops up in our, in our work. So on the left, um, uh, we're getting, just focusing on the analyst and, or the user perspective. We do work with different kinds of users. So for example, it might be a data scientist in a Jupyter notebook or a Databricks notebook. They want to upload some data set really fast. And so um, Arrow plays a lot in how that process works. Maybe once that's in there and maybe it's a data science or maybe it's actually a regular analyst in Power BI. Now that they have the data in there, they want to look at it and be able to kind of zoom in and zoom out really fast. And so we'll go over a bit about that and where um, Apache Arrow plays a role there. And on the right hand side, it's not just the graph visualization, but it's actually the um, graph compute pipeline and the graph AI. And so our ability to push a lot of data through and make it very interactive and, and have a lot of interesting AI algorithms and ML algorithms and ETL and all that, that comes down to something called um, Rapids we'll touch a bit on. And it, um, ultimately, it's about pipelining these things together really quickly. And so all of these ends up being pretty important. Um, and, and we're very invested in using Arrow end-to-end um, -end on these things. 
So um, I'm going to give a, I'll be giving a bunch of demos uh, today to give you a good intuition for it um, and for how Arrow pops up in different parts of the pipeline. And so as a fun first one is just to give a visual intuition. Um, what we're looking here is at um, one of our earliest uses of Arrow. And so here we're seeing some big data table of a lot of network events for um, a big Fortune 500. And then what's uh, fun is um, when we're looking at all those computers in that Fortune 500, uh, we can see not just each individual computer, but we can see uh, if we when we zoom out, um, we can see how they connect together based on alerts going on across the, the network. And so the fun thing with Arrow means that instead of just uh, having it in the browser, we can actually stream this stuff in um, from um, from the network, and, and this just all becomes live. Um, and so making that a, a live connection uh, is, is pretty important. Let's uh, jump back here. So uh, what was going on behind the scenes there in our ability to load uh, these large visualizations is we built one of the first um, uh, kind of commercial grade distributed renderings, renderers. And um, what's, what's a little interesting about behind the scenes here is we're kind of rethinking of how computing works in general. So we're redefining how a personal computer works where we've observed that you know, on your client side, we have um, GPUs uh, in, in your clients. On the server, we have GPUs uh, able to do all sorts of things. And then um, interestingly, in the middle, the internet has been getting a lot faster. And so instead of thinking of your visual experience as just being on one device, we can actually now think of this as almost like a global computer where um, you kind of have a thick client and a thick server, and then the network is, is just feeling instant. And so when, I'm inter when we're interacting, we can actually expect a lot more going back and forth. So instead of a static Google map, what if it's a live Google map? It just becomes a lot more realistic. And so when we're using Apache Arrow, we were trying to figure out how do we push megabytes of data per second um, and all the way from the, the server into the clients. Um, like the server is sort of on the end of that live ETL pipeline. And on the client, we're, um, we're going to push it all the way through um, uh, onto the, into the browser. And then not really actually, we try not to touch it in the, in the JavaScript in the browser. CPUs are kind of slow. Um, but we drop it right into the GPU. And we do it in a streaming way. So for example, when that um, geometry in the visualization I was showing you before is updating, we'll kind of get these um, incremental streams. We don't have to send all the data set, just the stuff that you're looking at, basically things like geometry and labels. And then we'll we'll actually do those in big chunks. And because of Arrow, it kind of gives us some nice guarantees. Like we're not um, having to do uh, all this extra data. We can just slice out what we want. Um, we don't have to do all of the data set. We can go in these nice little record batches or these uh, deltas. And then while one record batch is transferring through, or maybe we're processing it, we can actually start sending the next one. And so we're able to do a lot of these high performance computing tricks to really bump up what's possible visually um, in, in this kind of end-to-end -end GPU paradigm. And so having a, a reliable uh, format and optimized format like Apache Arrow is, is basically uh, essential nowadays for, for that kind of work. I'm going to give a, a, another um, uh, example here. And so on this one, um, beyond just like the, the visualization, we also uh, want to start doing some of the intelligence work. And so um, one of our uh, teammates, um, so uh, he actually came from this, um, we're doing a data for, for good project with him. And then he actually came onto our team last year. Um, some of the early research done in this project ended up um, being featured in the HBO documentary that was looking at unmasking who the leadership of QAnon is, which pushed a lot of the medical misinformation going on in the last few years, and then actually um, identified the particular ties to funding and things like that to um, US uh, elected officials, actually, and then some of their campaign staff. I will just leave it at that. Um, but the um, what I wanted to share here from the um, the, the demo side is um, what was going on kind of behind the scenes. So, um, and uh, let's let's just reload this, and you'll actually get to. We'll, we'll do this one a little bit live. And so, um, behind the scenes, we were looking at a lot of, um, and what you're seeing here is, in this case, five thousand um, uh, Twitter accounts that were just uh, involved in a lot of. Um, uh, in, a, in a lot of um, online discourse around medical misinformation. And we um, we did an end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline where at each phase, we we're just pushing a lot of data. And so just being able to push it as, as arrow, and I think it was something like 100 million tweets, something like that, uh, being able to push it each step through arrow was letting us, um, getting it to the point where now 
we have all these accounts that are clustered together. Um, without going too into detail, um, what's interesting about this one is, for example, Q Anonymous is known for being maybe 10 or 20 percent of the medical misinformation that was getting spread. And so we could do things like, for example, now um, color the accounts based off of how, how frequently you talk about QAnon, things like that. Um, and then uh, I want to give an example of kind of seeing that streaming that we were, I was just talking about before. We're actually running all of these computations in the data center, um, running the, the, whatever AI pipelines we want, streaming it into the browser, and then um, letting the analysts work with it. And so visually, analysts can not only benefit from all of the kind of the AI going on in the background, but they can actually see this, like in this case, 97,000 connections for the first time. Um, and so in this case, what we're looking at is um, a bunch of accounts that across the very many dimensions of data that we were looking at were actually fairly similar. So they might have been involved in the same campaigns or trying to um, might have been bots that were running through the same scripts. And some in this case were explicitly involved with QAnon and others were less uh, less obviously so. But in this case, the, the AI was able to sort of fingerprint them together to say, hey, these are probably very, very uh, related. Um, so yeah, so uh, um, Arrow has been very important for that kind of uh, the plumbing for for that kind of stuff. So um, stepping back a bit, um, I'm going to go back in time and kind of like where a lot of this came from, where a lot of that thinking was, and that kind of gives you a bit of uh, thought going forward. And and one and it's kind of shocking when I went back in my email to figure this out. Um, and I, I love this quote: um, "Every overnight success is uh, ten years in the making." And so this was um, uh, an email I had sent to Wes, one of the founders of uh, Voltron Data and one of the uh, founders of Apache Arrow. I sent this in 2015. Um, so we're not yet at 2025. So I expect a lot of great stuff to keep happening. But basically here, um, uh, Wes was, I think might have still been at Cloudera. Um, he was working on precursors to Apache Arrow. And I introduced the concept that we're working on of GPU accelerated data frames, which Obviously, now a lot of folks are using nowadays uh, through subsequent work at NVIDIA. Um, and uh, it was fun to kind of work work through that timeline uh, of around that, um, even actually going back another five, like five, seven years. Um, around that time, Wes was first starting Pandas to just look at making data frames accessible to regular uh, finance folks um, using Pandas um, um, and Python. At Berkeley, we were trying to figure out what's the um, sort of future of the visual experience. Uh, we're working on a parallel browser. Um, There's kind of a fun historical facts. Uh, that work, when we were thinking about how to do this end-to-end -end optimization, Mozilla was using that, our, some of our insights there, to motivate doing a lot of rethinking of how they built their own software. So for example, um, the Rust language uh, came out of that effort uh, as a way to implement what they're seeing was now possible. And now, uh, kind of as a fun circular thing, um, we even have Rust and Arrow are actually starting to, to become a thing. Um, but on our side, as we're trying to go through this vision of, of what computing can be, um, we then realize instead of needing, needing a new browser, we can actually ship a lot of this technology and existing um, dynamic language technologies. So web browsers, Node.js, things like that. Um, we're playing around with running this stuff through WebAssembly, web multiple web workers, things like that. Um, but where it really got interesting was in around 2015, where we said, hey, even though we can build this stuff, it's really hard as a team to really support like a full team building out a lot of software. So we needed abstractions for it. So back then, we were working on um, actually a JavaScript version of GPU data frames, partnering with AMD, folks like that. Um, but then, you know, wins turn. And so it was kind of exciting in 2016 when Josh Patterson, the uh, um, who I guess now is the CEO of Ultron Data, looked at what we were doing, realized that we can kind of go bigger and better via NVIDIA, doing it more of a community thing. Wes was going on the CPU train with Apache Arrow. So that was kind of when we finally officially all started coming together. And I think that's really when, as a community, the journey really began around that Go AI uh, initiative. Years later, big players like Uber, Databricks, everyone came on board. And now in our graph community, um, it's gone all the way now to just the, the regular CPU vendors like Neo4j just announced uh, Apache Arrow support. So to me, it's it's just been a like a very it feels like an overnight success, but it's actually been a very long road with a lot of uh, cool people doing a lot of good work. Um, and so that now when we are building uh, um, Graphistry today, 
we're rethinking not just what the client tier of what it means to build these amazing visual experiences and these AI experiences, we also think the, the server tier. And so off of that work with the NVIDIA Rapids community, nowadays what you could do in Graphistry is you could do something like just load in a bunch of log data or a bunch of event data, run it through us, get that ETL pipeline through all these great Python technologies, and then just plot it out. Um, and then behind the scenes, we're doing these distributed GPU arrow um, pipeline, you know, storage, ETL, analytics, machine learning, um, graph AI, graph visualization, all that stuff. Internally, as a team, that's actually really awesome because um, it's very easy to onboard people nowadays because it's the same Python data stack that they're, they're already familiar with. Now we just need to get them a bit more into the GPU thinking side. Um, so kind of uh, hinting at that, like uh, something we're, we're excited about on the um, arrow side that we're starting to um, get into now is um, this guy. And so um, again, this is a very early days for it. But what we're seeing is um, a lot of analysts are working with a lot of data sources. Um, so uh, kind of how I was already in the talk, I was, I was kind of sharing examples of working with different data sets. What we've been working on, um, uh, even without Arrow, just the ability to have a virtual graph over, let's say, your Splunk uh, security data, your Snowflake account data, and your Salesforce uh, sales data. And then being able to start creating the, these maps uh, um, of that go, th these workflows over them. So you could write your SQL or your Splunk queries and then have it all stitched together into these pictures. Um, where Arrow starts getting interesting to us, for, again, is not just internally for our pipeline, but when we're talking to these databases, like for example, Neo4j, even though we had been doing arrows for years, is only um, actually uh, this month that ne the Neo4j announced their arrow support. And now that means we can actually pull in a lot more data from, from Neo4j. So um, this is gonna be an area that we're gonna be very busy with uh, for, for the coming uh, next uh, year or two. Um, getting back here. Um, and as a very like a simple example of this, this is actually a demo we had done <laughs> a few years ago, but it's uh, still pretty relevant to what we're seeing. And is actually, again, for Neo4j's case, what they're basically showing on stage uh, earlier this month. On the left is um, we're taking, um, I think about 100,000 events, and then um, we're uploading them through our old uh, pre-arrow protocols. And on the right, again, in a Jupyter notebook, same data, but we're uploading them through Arrow. Um, and then this is actually round tripping through the internet. So this is like a very, you know, like a very realistic scenario. And you're seeing from going from that plot call, uh, the person on the right with Arrow um, is already starting to get into a visualization and exploring data. While on the left, it's still uh, going through the upload steps. Um, and so this kind of ability just to push more, more data through faster um, is just a very big experiential uh, shift for, for analysts. Um, to just make that a little uh, formal, we did some benchmarks. Uh, and again, I bet the numbers are way better nowadays. Um, but even uh, a few years ago, um, by the time we hit somewhere around, uh, somewhere around 100,000 million events, that's when we started uh, to um, really see that um, uh, basically multiple order, like one to two orders of magnitudes. It was when we started to see that shift of unoptimized IO to arrow IO. Um, uh, and so, yeah, and, see, and when by the time we hit like 5 million events that we're trying to push through for these interactive experiences, Arrow was still, you know, less than a second. But the, those other formats um, uh, were uh, like, uh, we're using Google protobufs. We're, we're um, already way past the one second. We're almost at 10 seconds. In other formats, we were just off the chart. By 10 million, it was completely shifted. Um, from an architecture perspective, this is actually kind of interesting. And it's both interesting to us, both from an internal perspective and also from an external perspective. So from an internal perspective, um, like I mentioned, we we used to do proto buffs and we ripped them out. Um, it's been great to be able to use Arrow because it's just uh, a lot more is uh, sort of out of the box. Um, it, you still get a lot of that like fixed schema, um, type schema, things like that. But we just have to do a lot less to get it. Um, also an interesting thing is we're able to abstract out a lot of the data representation tier as part of that. And so for a lot of our code nowadays, we came up with this mantra of arrow and SQL in um, and arrow out, and it's all just running over HTTP. So this is like a very normal looking interface. And what that meant is, for example, when um, uh, Blazing SQL hit uh, end of life around the um, Log4j incident, I think earlier this year or late last year, 
um, it was very fast for us to, to drop that and replace it with a, with another GPU SQL called uh, Dask SQL. It just took us a week or two and it all just worked, all the types, everything worked out. And so that, I think that was like a, a good testament to just architecturally, like what the, the quality that Arrow is at. Um, externally for our users, I already talked about making faster uploads, but it's also actually more reliable for users. So for example, um, when, when I love and it comes up with the customers a lot, it's often like those, those little boring things in life that are kind of like add up. It's something like, for example, date times. If somebody uploads a date time in Apache Arrow, they know that in Graphistry, they're going to get that time bar for free, that they can start really explore the time dimensions of their data. But when we get a, like a CSV or a JSON or something, like in, in a lot of systems uh, today, actually still like that's all, all you can get out of them. All of a sudden, they don't really know if, if that's actually the UI is going to do the right thing or if they're going to hit data errors. And so having that at the arrow type data at the data plane has been really great. Looking ahead um, for Graphistry, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, obviously, we're doing more and more with GPUs. Even if you don't have one, could we do things remotely? Um, we've done experiments with NVIDIA and others. Uh, how do we do 100 gigabytes per second for interactive experiences? Um, doing things like, could you stream um, Apache Arrow from 100 uh, or tw like 20 to 100 um, solid state disks? And how do you actually do that for your interactive experiences? Um, getting to issue scenarios like maybe somebody has a Spark and Ray cluster that's doing distributed Arrow. Could we actually then load that quickly into the Graphistry runtime where we're using things like Dask QDF and just really do fast uh, transfers for those? And so in all of these, uh, Arrow is just such a big component of it. Um, I'm going to give uh, one shout out if, if you want to uh, try some of this stuff on your own. And um, if you're not already using Arrow, um, hopefully you are. But if not, um, I, this is kind of a fun case. Um, basically, CSVs are everywhere. So take your favorite unstructured data set. Um, so in this case, we're looking at the top 1,000 cryptocurrencies. And um, you can actually, we've been doing a lot of like automating graph AI recently. So in this case, for example, you just load in every one of those uh, rows as a node. We'll run a dimensionality reducer, like a graph-based one like UMAP. And in this case, what we got, for example, even though we had all that um, heterogeneous data about all, like with all these, you know, text string, date times, textual descriptions, we were able to do these automatic maps of, of what's going on and what are all the correlations in your data and how they're interacting, things like that, and how to connect the dots. And behind the scenes, it's doing all of that uh, um, great uh, um, Arrow stuff. Uh, let me jump back here. Um, so, and, and again, end-to-end uh, -end arrow from the client to the server. So it's pretty exciting. So just uh, pip install Graphistry AI, and you'll be able to start doing graph neural networks and new map and things like that. Um, also, I should mention, um, if this stuff is cool, um, we are hiring, and so are our customers. So if you're into global supply chain, misinformation, cybersecurity, um, definitely a lot of data infrastructure, a lot of uh, graph analytics, and then also if you want more on the mission side, just a lot of people doing really good stuff with technology uh, like and underneath like um, Arrow for, for scaling it. Um, and with that, I just want to say thank you. And um, if you are online after this event, uh, I will be around taking questions um, and enjoy the, the rest of the event.